Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar from Spec Innovations, an overview of model-based systems engineering using Innislate. My name is Elizabeth Steiner, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. First, I would like to go over some housekeeping before we get started. During the presentation, feel free to send us questions, and we will get them answered in the question and answer part of the webinar. You can also interact with us on LinkedIn through the Innislate user group or through Twitter using the handle at Innislate. The webinar is being recorded and we will make it available to you after the live presentation, so be sure to keep an eye out for it in your inbox. Now I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Daniel Hanaba. He'll be sharing with you how to leverage the power of model-based systems engineering through Innislate's unique modeling and simulation features. Daniel Hadema is a systems engineer here at Spec Innovations. He assisted in the development of Innislate. Daniel continues to lead the developers in improving the systems and engineering applications in their software development. He has also co-authored several published papers, including Applying Systems Thinking to Model-Based Systems Engineering, an Agile Systems Engineering Approach to Software Project Development. He has also done modeling and architecture development for the Department of the Navy, United States Marine Corps, and United States Army. Feel free to send Dan any questions through the LinkedIn user group or send him an email. And now I will hand over the controls to Daniel and he will get started. Hello, my name is Daniel Hadama. And so what are we gonna cover today? So our agenda for today is what is model-based systems engineering? Why do we need it? What are the characteristics of model-based systems engineering? What is a tool's role in MBSE, or model-based systems engineering? How does Innoslate aid in MBSE? We're gonna then do a live demonstration, and finally, we'll end it with some questions and answers. So what is model-based systems engineering? Well, according to Encosi, model-based systems engineering is the formalization, is a formalized application of modeling to support system requirements design analysis, verification, and validation beginning in the conceptual design phase and continuing through development and later life cycle phases. Now, for those who, all who don't know, INCOSI stands for the International Council on Systems Engineering, and they're the professional organization that is spearheading systems engineering. And that's a pretty good definition, except for the fact that it kind of uses a lot of big words. So why don't we try to break it down into, well, what is a model, first off? And so the SEBOC, the Systems Engineering Body of Knowledge, says that a models are representations that can aid in defining and analyzing and communicating a sets of concepts. So what type of models can we have? Well, we have physical models or functional models, and they often are some sort of representation of reality. The functional model gives us a means to understand the key steps in any given process while a physical model provides a means to represent the implementation of a capability. So why do we need to do systems engineering, especially model-based systems engineering? Well, the old way of doing systems engineering, and I'm sure many of you have had experience with this, is you'd be handed a lot of documents, you'd read them, and you'd start to draw all your diagrams. Well, but then you get updates, and you have external inputs and influences and all of a sudden you have to start updating your diagram. And this process continues and you continue to update until finally you think you have the final document but you've lost all traceabil traceability back to the original thing and so who knows what your diagrams are really representing anymore. And so you pass it down the stream, it goes off to manufacturing and you end up with things that don't quite work out. And so now you have to spend loads of money uh, to fix your processes and actually get back to the products you were trying to design. So what does model-based system engineering do that aids in that? So the first step is model-based system engineering, you do is you take your document and you bring it into the model. And so from there, you use the model to start generating your documents. So here we have things like a sequence diagram and an IDAP and a hierarchy, but these are being driven by the background model. And so as we take the updates, we can include them into the model and keep that traceability going, and we can also capture more of the external inputs. And so with all that, we can update our diagrams, and we're constantly keeping that key traceability. 
So now we can take our model and we can send it off and we finally get the product we're looking for and hopefully we saved in time and money and special in time and money so that way the overall cost is less in the total process. So what are some of the key characteristics of model-based systems engineering? Well, the first one is data retention. The key thing is data is stored in some sort of database. It's no longer the stacks of drawings and reports that classic engineers are used to seeing on everyone's desks. So you would put your documents in some sort of data repository, and as a user, you would go to that repository and get that document, and it would constantly be the live updated document. You don't have to worry about, well, I have this version, but this is the new version. Which one are we building to? Another characteristic is you should start formalizing your process. So there should be no major changes in how you design your system. Obviously, this is as a caveat in the sense that depending on how you're designing your system, you'd make minor changes. But overall, you should have a formalized process. You should also be improving your efficiency by allowing repeat use of model elements. No longer are you required to constantly parse inputs and put documents, um, you can reuse those and you can take them from one model to the other model. All this reduces the system engineering task um, so that way you can, you know who's done what and you know how it's working. So what are the characteristics of MBSE? So the first one is an executable behavior logic. So what they do is they show a collections of functions as they happen in series or parallel. The key here is the fact that it gives you the ability to, ability to simulate these functions as they progress. This gives you two things. One, it performs some basic error logic, and you can start doing some analysis on this. So you can see here we have in the top model A, B happening sequentially. In the next middle one, it's A, B are happening in parallel. And in the final model down bottom, A, B are happening in parallel. But you can see the fact that we have a, an error in the logic because A is waiting for something from B and B is waiting for something from A. And so neither one can start. So another key thing is that views are built from data. Once again, data is reused and not redrawn. And so changes to the model changes the view. So views can also show the same piece of data in different ways. Many of you are probably familiar with the IDEF0 and the N squared. Both show the functions and their inputs and outputs, but both show them in very different ways. Another example is the con context diagram and a class diagram. Both show assets or components and their connections to and from other assets. So there's five key viewpoints when you're modeling a system, and these come from Kerrigan and Honigan, I know I pronounced their names incorrectly, and that's kind of the word I live in. But so the first one is environmental. And in what environmental, you capture the system boundaries, the operational concepts, and the objectives of the system performance. The second one they identified is the data or information view. And this addresses the relationship among the data elements that cross between the system boundaries and those that are internal to the system. The third they identify is the process view, which examines the functionality of the system and how it uses and how it is used to create the functional architecture. The fourth is behavior, which addresses the control structures in which the system functions are in. And the fifth is implementation, which examines the marriage of both the physical architecture with the behavior architecture and uh, the, combines those together in kind of one major architecture. And often we'll see things like three and four being combined together, or even one, two, and three, um, as we'll discuss later. I'm sorry, two, three, and four. So what is a tool's role in model-based systems engineering? So the first thing that really makes a good model-based systems engineering tool is the fact that they should capture source documents. Second thing is it needs to provide views of the data. Just collecting the data in some sort of data repository doesn't really help very much. We need to be able to have views and see it in various ways. The third thing is that a good tool should support linkages between model elements. Models that don't have uh, models that don't have any linkages can't 
have the traceability back to the original source documentation. The fourth is it should allow multiple users to interact. We live in a collaborative world nowadays. Not many of us get the privilege or unfortunate to work by themselves doing one thing. We have to work with others, and having to play the game of passing around a document really isn't acceptable anymore. And the fifth thing is it should output data as reports. We understand that you need to be able to take your data and pass it on to someone else, either up the chain or down the chain, and that needs to be in some sort of report. So how does InnoSlate aid in model-based systems engineering? Well, the first thing is InnoSlate does document capture. And so what you can do is we have what's called a requirements view, and you can bring in your initiating requirements or various other documents, and you can model those and have each one and do the traceability from here. InnoSlate also allows you to start building the model in the action diagram, and these combine the behavior, the process, and also even some of the physical models in one views into one single view. And this is ideal for showing a process, the interactions between the assets and the resources. So but what makes up an action diagram? Well, an action diagram is broken up into eight key things. So the first one is an action, which is often referred to as either a function or activity or some sort of task, and it's the basic process element. The second thing is what is called a parallel. And normally you do things in sequences, but with a parallel you can actually have two things happen at the same time. So action A and action B can happen at the same time. Our second thing is an or. So there's some sort of decision that has to happen where depending on the, that decision, a sequence of actions can happen depending on which one. And so you can go down different paths. The next one is what we call a sync which is an action where the action can control the durations of the actions that precede it. And that's a very powerful um, tool. The next one we have is what's called a loop. And this is a type of action that will loop some finite number of times in of the actions that follow it directly. Our next thing is an input-output. And this is a logical piece of data that's passed between actions. Uh, our next thing we have is branch assets. This would be the asset or performer, depending on how you like to talk about things, who performs the actions on that line. And we often use this to show swim lanes, so that way we can show which performer is performing any given action. And our final thing is our resources. And this is a physical representation of the material that can be consumed, produced, or seized by an action. And so that way we can model things like fuel. So some of the other visual, visualizations that InnoSlate has is we also do have an IDEF0. And if you've been familiar with this, you know that we have functions down the middle, and those are our actions. We also have mechanisms, which we use as our assets or performers. We have outputs, which is just the generates an input-output in the underlying schema language of lifecycling modeling language, often referred to as LML. We have controls which come in from the top, and that's just a receives an input output where the trigger is set to true. We have an input, which is once again a receives input output, but this time the trigger is set to false. And but one of the key things to keep away, to keep in mind, sorry, when you are dealing with IDEF zeros is the fact that there's no behavior logic. You can't see really a sequence step, and often it's implied that the top thing happens and then it kind of goes down the line which necessarily isn't always the case. Another view we have is a sequence diagram. And these give you our lifelines, and we use those as assets and messages that can be passed between each of those lifelines, which are often input outputs. And once again here, this does not show the functional allocation, which, depending on what you're trying to model, is both good and bad. We also have an n-squared diagram, and this shows the data, inputs and outputs, passed between the functions or actions, depending on in the, our terms. And as in all the other previous ones, this once again does not show behavior logic. And this is still a viable uh, diagram that is often used if you're only focusing on showing your inputs and outputs. 
But on the physical side, we also have an asset diagram, which can show the relationships between assets. And these assets can often be organizations or components. And this is often useful for generating some sort of context diagram. And so you can see here in this restaurant model that we'll be talking about later, that the restaurant interacts with the credit card system, an online ordering system, and an online booking system. One of the key ways of showing some sort of decomposition layers is with a hierarchy diagram. And InnoSlate does include a hierarchy diagram, and you can use this on any of InnoSlate's classes to easily add and modify your hierarchy going up and down. But if you have a really large hierarchy, we have what's called the tree diagram. And what this allows you to do is visualize very massive hierarchies in a structure that actually works and was designed to view big data. But if you're dealing with software classes, one of the things you may need to do is provide a class diagram. And here, InnoSlate does have a class diagram that we can use for showing data modeling or software. Another key view that InnoSlate has excuse me, is the element relationships. And this is what we call the spider diagram. And this diagram is able to show you all of the relationships from any given entity in the diagram. And so you can see that how each one is related and who all the connections are. And that way you can know the underlying data structure with the relationships. InnoSlate also comes with a lot of reports. We have ConOps, we have many of the JSID products, we have entity-based reports, we have DODAF, even a whole DODAF view requirements. We have the ability to do reports that you can trace your relationships. We have many powerful reports to aid, in, to aid the systems engineer. So some of our other views that we have is a database view. And this is really a view that's meant for our power users who really need to get in and start messing with and start linking things together. One of our cool features that we're most proud about is the dashboard. And this shows you a nice activity diagram, act, sorry, not activity diagram, activity list of the recent notifications that happened on the left, along with various database statistics, including model maturity. As we talked about earlier, the fact that a good system engineering tool needs to be able to collaborate. And InnoSlate has live collaboration. And we have the ability to do what we call cross-view collaboration. And this gives us the ability that you can be working with one user in, let's say, an n squared diagram. And another user could be looking at that same piece of model in the IDAF diagram. And you'd be able to get your changes back and forth. We also have a group chat built in straight into the tool, so you don't have to use another system. So now I'm going to do a little live demonstration for you guys and show how we can actually do model-based systems engineering inside InnoSlate. So the first thing when you log into InnoSlate, you're going to be greeted by a dashboard. And so as you can see here, we have this getting started pane. Um, and in here, you can select what you're interested in. We have things like functional analysis, program management, VNV. But for right now, I'm just going to select full lifecycle. And this allows me to easily jump around and create uh, various diagrams, import sample projects. So from here, I can import a DODAF sample project. I can import an action diagram sample project, a project management sample project. And it's a good place that I can jump straight to things like the creating a risk management plan, things like that. So the model we're going to start modeling today is a restaurant system. Now, I wonder, many of you probably are wondering, how did I come up with a restaurant system to model? Well, it came out of a conversation I had at SEDC, Systems Engineering in DC at 2014, held earlier this year. And the discussion was about, how do you show and explain models to people who don't understand models? And the answer that we came up with as this group during the reception was, you have to do something that everyone was familiar with. And I figure everyone has probably at least once gone to some sort of restaurant in their, system, in their life. So our model today is going to focus on the actions and the communications between customers, staff, and the computer system. 
And obviously, this model is going to be very abstract. I do not recommend you start a business based on my model. And really, one of the key things, though, is the fact that this shows that systems engineering, along with model-based systems engineering techniques, can be applied to everything from aerospace even to zoo management. So the first thing we're going to talk about is documents capture. Now, many of you are probably given some sort of requirements document. And if you're not, that's fine. But if you are, what we have is what we call the import analyzer. And so if we go to the menu button in that top left, and under tools, we have the import analyzer. And so from here, we just have to select import file, and we can select my requirements document, so restaurant requirements. And if I click open, all we do is put in my starting number, which I already know is 1.0. And this is going to go ahead and analyze our document, identify the requirements, parse them out, and send us straight over to requirements view. And so now I have parsed in, and it's identified which ones are requirements, which ones are headers. And so you can see here it's already done that work, and it's built my hierarchy for me. So you can see with this, we have my simple hierarchy, my simple re restaurant requirements already set up. And from here, I can do things like run the quality checker and things like that. So but now that we have that, let's actually start building our model. And so for the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build an action diagram. So we're going to start at the dashboard because it's a nice place to kind of jump around. And we're going to create a new action diagram, which you can be found under the functional analysis. So we're going to give this a name. And I like to be a little meta here. So I like to call things meta universe. And we go ahead and hit continue. And so from this, we're going to start just by adding actions. And so our first one is going to be, we're going to say, we greet the customer. So after we've done that, and you can see we just take one action from the left, drag it over, and you can see the little icon turns into a green plus, and also the line behind it turns green. And that's how you know you can drop it. And so we can drop again, take customer to table. And you can see it's fairly easy just to sit here Start drawing out all of our actions as we go. Take the drink orders. Let's see, then we can make some drinks, etc. And so you can see here, what we've done is we just pretty easily started creating a simple functional diagram. Except for the fact that is this really what we want to do? Now, many people like to think things are very sequential, except for it's not always sequential. So we have many players already going on here that's not being captured. And so also we're not capturing the fact that our customer is not actually being part of this. And what about data being transferred there? So we need to really start expanding on this. Now, if you've ever dealt with other tools, you may know that you probably would have to throw away all this and start again. But in a slate, you can actually just redraw in the model. So what we're going to do is I know that we're going to have to show the interactions of many assets. So I'm going to drag over a parallel, parallel construct from the side and drop it in the start. And you can see I've gone ahead and added it. And I can come up here and do add branch. And we can add a couple more. So now we've added five total branches. And so we can take let's see so we've added our branches and now let's go ahead and start applying names to some of these so the first one we're going to say would be the customer and so this would be the customer's branch everything that would go on here the next thing would be the waiter we can now add a host branch Uh, computer system branch and then a kitchen staff branch and you can see I was able to easily drag those over from the side and so now what I can do is I can select what the ones I want and so greet the customer is done by the host and so I can just select it 
and drag it over to the new location where I want. And once again, the little icon turns green plus, and the line in the background turns green. And I can just drop, and now we've moved it. So we can move these things around, take customer to the table. And so we go, okay, so, well, before, so when they, they greet the customer, we need to actually start having the data being transferred. So we say greet the customer, and so there's going to be a greeting that happens. And so this would be an I.O. that would happen. And so we greet the customer. The customer would have to inform number of people. And we can use these little green box circles on the sides of the I.O. to easily drag and drop things. And so you can see here this would be a trigger. So this way, greeting the customer has to happen before the customer informs the host the number of people. And you would continue this process, and you can start building your model. Now, I'm not going to sit here and make you guys watch me as I start building this model. So I'm going to do a little TV magic trick I learned um, from watching a lot of TV, cooking shows specifically. And we're going to pull another thing out of the other oven. And just like that, we have a completed diagram. So, but we're not quite done yet because we can still do some more changes. So one of the key things that we have here is on this left side is when we select any given action, the left bar changes. And so here we can actually go ahead and change attributes. So things like duration, start time, name, number, and description. So for here, we can go ahead and say make drinks. It probably does not take an hour to make a drink. I'm going to say it takes three minutes to make the drinks. Here we can also do things like adding our resources over. So you can see here down bottom on the kitchen staff, they've already made the food, but we haven't sent it off to the customer for actually enjoyment. So we're going to add a new resource and call this one food. Super descriptive. And once again, using the green circles on the sides of the action here, drag one over and drop it on top of food, which will then go ahead and automatically create the necessary relationships underneath. And using the same process, repeat this and drop it on top. And you can see here, we can say that consumes or seizes. And so because this is a resource, it has a finite amount. And so we're going to say it consumes the food instead of seizing it, because at the end of the process, the food is not released. That'd be a very different model we'd be modeling. So one of the nice things we can do here is we can switch and go look at all the other views straight from the diagram. So up here in this menu bar area, we have what's called the open button. And if we go ahead and click on this and we go open, we'll go jump to the, I lost, it. oh, I was selecting one, sorry. Open, if we have none selected, we can jump and view the associated uh, views that are from the same data. And so, for example, from an action diagram, we can look at the sequence diagram. And so if we do the open and jump straight to sequence, here you can see we show the relationship between the customer, the host, the kitchen, and the waiter. Now here we can also, once again, rename things just by clicking on them. And so let's say instead of number of people, we say number of guests. And we want to maybe add another one. That So after the customer is done eating the host and we can select the host lifeline and use this little green dot and drag it over to the bottom of the customer lifeline and we can create a new signal back and say thank you. And so just like that we're able to add another piece of data to our underlying model in a nice clean interface. Now if you didn't want to keep these things you can always cancel your save by clicking the drop down next to the save button and do discard changes. So this will take you to an entity view. And this is kind of the underlying power user feature that some of you are may be familiar with as you used it. And so from here, we're going to look at, I'm going to talk more about entity view here. So inside entity view, you can see we have the name, number, description, along with some more attributes in that center column. And depending on your screen size, this could change. 
we also have relationships over on the left. And these are organized by tabs in kind of a grouping depending on for each relationship. And so depending on the entity you're on, you may see a different select grouping. And so you can see here under popular, we have decomposes, decomposed by, and all would obviously show you all of the relations. We can also do things like upload an image over here. So instead of seeing just action, we can upload an image. So for example, I'm going to go back to our database view by clicking on the database icon on the top left. We're going to select the asset diagram and I want to say, I want to create a new asset. And you can do that by clicking the blue button that says new entity and create a new asset. And so we're going to say the restaurant. Oops, there it goes. Um, and so we do a quick save here, and we can upload the restaurant image. And just like that, we now have an image attached to that. So one of the cool things about the, excuse me, one of the cool things about InnoSlate is the fact there's always an underlying history underneath. And so I can go to any asset here and so let's say instead of cola we want to say soda and so we can do a quick save here and that doesn't that allows us to save but without leaving the view and we can always go look at the history and see version one oh the name was cola and i can always revert back to this version and just like that we've maintained our traceability in the history Let's see, let's go to our hostess here and we're going to add a relationship. So you can see it's already assigned these performs by action and that's done by the action diagram. When we drag those actions over to individual branches that we saw with the parallel, it automatically added the performs relationship. But now what we're going to do is we're going to add a cost. So under the program management, there's an incurs cost and we can click on this over on the right side where it says the drop down next to add, we can do a new cost and we're just going to say hosts cost. And InnoSlate comes with distributions built in and you can see we have all the popular ones. And so for example, we're going to say it's going to have a normal cost with a mean of 16 and a standard deviation of two. Our units is going to be in dollars, so we can just use the dollar sign. And our rate, because it's not fixed, we're going to say per hour. Excuse me. And with that, we can hit the submit. And now we've automatically created a new entity, added the relationship without having to leave the single view. So now if we go back to the popular tab, we can start jumping around and clicking on these relationship entities and start going straight to their entity view. So here we can say assign table. We can see that it's all part of meta universe click up here and now we're back to that main action and up at the top and so let's go back to the action diagram and from here what we have is the inner site simulator and you can see if we click on the blue button and click discrete event we'll go ahead and get to a, a new view and we can hit start and this is what it's going to do it's going to read the action diagram read the control step logic that's all there look at the IOs, figure out what's going to happen, and actually go ahead and start building that out. And you can see it's already done, and it's outputted our display as a very nice Gantt chart that's easy to read. And you can see I've changed only one of them, which was the make drinks, and you can see it's a very small sliver. Our resources, and we haven't fully fleshed out this model, but we'd also have things like showing the levels. We do have costs. And as you can see, we have an asset cost up on this tab, and this would be the cost of the asset because we added that cost relationship to the host. So now let's start looking at building the physical side. So we're going to go back to dashboard, to database, I mean, and create a new asset. And I like to be metaphysical some more, so let's call this one the universe because everything is in the universe. Um, I just want to show a simple hierarchy. And so what we're going to do 
is we're actually going to use the relationship viewer to build these. And so we're going to go over here on the right side under relationships and where it says decomposed by children, we're going to add new assets. So we're going to go ahead and add the restaurant system. And my fingers don't always work. Let's see, add another one called the credit card system. Let's see, add the online booking system. And finally, we'll add the online ordering system. And so we've used now Entity View to create those relationships that we can easily view by going to, for example, the hierarchy diagram. And so you can see here, we now said that the universe has an online booking system, a restaurant system, a credit card system, and an online ordering system all underneath it. And we can easily jump around and go straight to, let's say we want to look at this, the restaurant systems, excuse me, the restaurant systems, and we can click on the restaurant system box in the diagram and use the open, and we can jump straight to entity view and see its entity view from there. But what if with nothing selected, we can also go look at the asset diagram. And so you can see here, we now just have four boxes, but we can move these around and start establishing linkages between them. So for example, the restaurant system is going to be connected to the credit card system. The online booking system will be connected to the restaurant system. The online ordering system would be connected to the credit card system. Move this one over there, make it nice and pretty. Online ordering system is also connected to the restaurant system. And so from here, we can either name these, so give these, we can name these whatever we like. So for example, um, we can type in here orders. And so we can rename them. And this is actually renaming the connection that goes between them in the schema. Or if we want, we can actually turn them off by under this line label and click hide. And so we can go through, do that. And so now we're starting to make this look like a very simple context diagram. And so we can maybe make this a nice dash line, things like that. And then once again, if we wanted to, we can even upload an image here. And so you can see how powerful this becomes in creating a very nice contextual or asset diagram. So we're going to go to this restaurant system and use that trick I talked about earlier of going straight to Entity View by selecting it and do the Open Entity. And from here, we have what we call characteristics. And characteristics are kind of an, a relationship to a key attribute that you can use on various locations. And they can be used in many different ways. So on this system, what we're going to say is I want to add some asset, some characteristics of the restaurant system. And so we're going to say a new characteristic. And so we're going to say the minimum number of waiters, so the minimum number needed to uh, service the, the restaurant. And we're going to say three. We can add another one here. This time we're going to do the maximum number of guests. Always a good thing to capture in your model so we don't break fire code. And finally, we're going to add the minimum number of kitchen staff. And that will be four. And so what you can do with this, though, is InnoSlate has what we call the radar diagram. And you can jump straight to this by selecting diagrams radar. And here you can see we've easily shown these characteristics in a very nice view. And But from this, we can go ahead and we can modify these values straight in the diagram. 
So let's say the minimum number of kitchen staff really isn't four, it's actually seven. So we can do things like that. And by saving, will take us back. And if we go back to kitchen staff, you can see the value has been updated, updated in the underlying database. Um, let me do, let's go back to this restaurant system. And we're going to add some existing entities as for the decomposition layer. And so we can just click the select. And so you can see here we have the host, the waiter, the kitchen, and the customer. And so we're going to add those to the system as a decomposition layer. And so we just click those, add, and there we go. Now we've added four more children underneath this restaurant system. So if we hit save and go back to database view, we can see here we have a list of all of our model elements. We can start doing our traceability. But one of our ways to do traceability is the fact we can start creating and assigning things. So let's say we want to go um, and we're going to say take customer to table. And over here we have trace from statement. So we can just click the add button. And so it shall say the host shall greet customers. And you can search in here um, and find things. But for this example, I'm just going to click that and click add. And now we've supported our traceability. And so now we have that traceability back to the original document. So passing, so now that we've started building our model and we need to pass it on to the next layer, we need to start giving it an, something they under, someone else would start understanding. And so InnerSlate has what we call the requirements generator. And so we can go to an asset and under the more button, we can do click generate requirements. And this is a really cool feature in the sense that what it'll do is it'll go through the model, it'll read the model, and it'll actually start building a requirements document for that model. And so you can see here that the universe shall be de decomposed by these things. And so it starts grouping them and it even looks at its children and says what shall happen. So for here, exa the example would be the host shall perform take customers to table. And this way you can start passing this on um, and doing your V and V on top of this. Now, one of the cool things with this, though, is the fact that as you change your model, you can easily update this requirements generator. And so we're going to go back to my action diagram. That's a good place that we like to hang out in. Mm -hmm. Action diagram. And so from here, what we can do is we can change some of the duration. So let's say we want to eat food. Well, we're going to be relatively slow eaters, and we'll say it's going to take 35 minutes. Or maybe we're going to assign the table, and it's another normal distribution in seconds of 50 with a mean of 10. So just like that, we were able to update our model. And so now we can go back to the universe, that top level asset, and rerun requirements generator on that. And you'll see what that'll do is it'll automatically baseline the requirements and change only the ones that needed to be changed. And so you can see the fact that we've had some changes and that's what the blue indicates. So what are some of the next steps? Now that we have our requirements generator, we can start running reports and all those can be found under our reports tab over there under menu tools reports. But we can also run our model maturity checker under dashboard. And so you can go ahead and click the run now. And you can see, so we're at 56%. And if you click on show results, you can see how, where all this came from. And this was actually done via research from Stevens and NPS, I believe. And once again, I've talked many times about having to share. And we can go ahead and in that menu bar, click the share. And we can share with other users here 
giving them either owner permission, read write permission, or read only permission. And read only allows the user to actually comment in the model. Read write obviously allows them to add and modify, and owner allows them to have even more control over who has permissions. And so that concludes the demonstration. And so now it's time for the question and answer portion of the webinar. Thanks, Daniel. We've received several questions already. If you haven't done so, please send your questions through the panel on the right. Daniel will answer as many questions as he can before our time is up. Our first question is, are the documents formatting requirements for a successful document import documented anywhere? Yes, you can actually find those. Let me switch back. You can see how to do that if we go back to that menu, import analyzer, and there's instructions on what to do right in here. So support file type, and it's a link, and this will open up and take you to how to properly format uh, your, your Word document so that way Interslate can parse it. Our next question is, can the eat duration be based on the quantity of the resource? Yes and no. Uh, InnoSlate has what's called scripting built in underneath. Um, so if I jump over here and we go back to action. So our eat food, so we have what's called sim scripts. And so underneath here, we can write custom scripts. And But this is a very complex thing. Um, there's no nice way of doing it. This requires a very high level understanding of both um, some code development and also understanding the model. Our next question, how is version control performed for an entire model or database? Can two models or databases be compared against one another to find changes? InnoSlate does not currently have version control on the whole model. It is a feature that we are looking at um, currently and in investigating on how to do it. Um, I, that's a very good question with looking between two models um, and two different projects. I do not know on that one. So if you send me an email, I can get provide you more information on that one. Our next question. How does one implement in Innoslate the concept of a change request that must undergo an approval process? So the way Innoslate will handle something like that is you can see down here the comment field. Um, and so if you will have someone that wants to modify your database, they can type in, you can share them with read-only access and say, I would like to change this. So value should be 45 seconds. And so you can post this comment. And so this will show up both in this dashboard and also as a project owner, you will get a notification via email of that. And so that way you can go ahead and then act on those things. And so you can see this dashboard takes me, I have a link, takes me straight to this entity and I can see it and I can make it. And that's how InnoSlate currently implements kind of a change request style. Our last question is, can you change the color on the boxes of the diagram? You can. Um, I've talked about how you can change the line colors. So let's go back to that meta universe. And if we go to action diagram, you can see here. So maybe for some reason, we want to actually have this be a different color. We can go in and start making this a nice blue out a different background, something in that light orange. Um, and so this way you can start building your diagrams and kind of the color palette that you're looking to do. And if we save and we come back, it's still going to be there. So, and you can do that to even IOs. And this gives you control to build your diagrams. So that way it doesn't look plain. You can really customize it and even show some highlighting features. That is all the questions and answers that we have time for today. We would like to thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. As a reminder, we will be following up with you very soon to send you a link to the recording and the presentation slide deck. We would also like to invite you to our next webinar in December, so be sure to check your email for the invitation.
We also encourage you to visit our website and our blog as well as connect with us on social media. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you again for your attendance and we hope to see you again at our next webinar in December. Please enjoy the rest of your day.